Welcome to the Highly Sensitive Person Podcast. A podcast for people who experience the world intensely. Join me on a journey of acceptance of our highly sensitive person traits. Welcome to episode 72 of the Highly Sensitive Person Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly. It's that time of the year again, the holiday season, and for the fourth year now, I've created a gift guide for highly sensitive people and introverts. I know those are not the same thing, but just for the sake of this list, I've kind of lumped them together. I really enjoy putting this list together, and I keep my eyes and ears open all year to try to find gifts that HSPs would enjoy. And honestly, I actually think the list is better as a list of gifts to treat yourself with. (laughs) You can check it out at highlysensitiveperson.net slash gifts. Before I get into this episode, I want to read a blog comment I got from a listener a while back. As you guys know, I often do this before the content of the shows just to help you realize that you aren't alone in how you feel. There are lots of us out there learning and discovering more about ourselves. This comment is a response to episode 38, which was about handling criticism. The commenter writes, All of my life I was made to believe that I was a coward or weak, fearful, broken, anxious, panicky, or defective, because I was always different from most men. When I saw myself as broken, my only option seemed to be to approach things with a I-have-to-fix-everything-that's-wrong-with-me mentality that took a lot of wasted years from my life. Seeing myself as anxious and fearful, there were never gifts to build upon. After spending time listening to your show, I now see that there are many gifts in being highly sensitive. Almost instantly, all of the false data and false labels that were stuck to me by myself, others, and the world peeled off and fell to the ground. So many memories and past experiences make sense to me now. I went from a place of shame and guilt to a place of self-understanding, self-acceptance, self-compassion. I got criticized yesterday and I felt hurt this morning. This episode helped me to see that it's okay to care less, to let go. I guess I always thought that caring less made me a bad person, so I always made it a point to dissect everything people said to me in order to fix it and to never repeat the mistake. Exhausting. I'm really, really happy to hear that I am allowed to care less. Thank you so much for that wonderful, thoughtful comment. As you all know, I've said many times, learning about high sensitivity and introversion for me changed my life. I created the blog and this podcast to try to get this information out there to try to help others also learn about high sensitivity, just the way I did. It's great to hear when it actually does reach someone and help them. So when I started this podcast, my number one dream guest was Susan Kane. So it goes without saying that I'm very happy to bring you this episode today. Susan's 2012 book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking, was my first introduction to introversion. The book changed my life and the lives of thousands and thousands of people worldwide because it changed my understanding of myself. It was the first time I valued my quiet, interfacing nature instead of wishing I was different. It was through learning about introversion that I eventually learned about high sensitivity. I wouldn't be talking to you right now without Susan's book having been the inception to all of it. Susan Kane is the co-founder of Quiet Revolution, which you can find at quietrev.com, which is a site that features advice and stories for introverts and extroverts alike on how to appreciate our quiet sides. Her first book, Quiet, that I mentioned earlier, has been translated into 40 languages and has been on the New York Times bestseller list for over four years. Her record-smashing TED Talk has been viewed over 14 million times. She also authored a book this year called Quiet Power, The Secret Strengths of Introverts, which is a book meant for introverted teens and kids. She's also an honors graduate of Princeton and Harvard Law School. All right, so let's get to the interview. I'd like to welcome Susan Kane to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. 
There's so many things I admire about you and all the work you've done over the past few years. And there's a lot of things I've always wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. So you started out as a Wall Street lawyer before writing your book. And I've always wondered, how did you end up in that field? Why did you choose to be a lawyer? And what was it like being in that world as an introvert? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, so I had always wanted to be a writer. And then I went to college and I took some classes in creative writing. And I I took classes in fiction writing, um, which I turned out to be not very good at. And I thought, oh, you know what? That whole writing thing was just a kind of, you know, dream of youth. And it's time to put it away and get adult about this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I, I kind of felt like, I, I, you know, I, I think from the time I was a kid, I guess I talked about this in the book in TED Talk, I was always feeling like, well, even though my my true sweet spot is in a kind of quieter, more creative setting, you know, that I should be able to thrive out in a more, you know, alpha and bold type of space. So I found myself between those two things um, applying to law school. And then the crazy thing was, I actually really liked it once hmm. I was there. Like I liked law school more than almost anyone else I knew. Because um, <laughs> I think I was there with the attitude of a tourist or a traveler, mm. where it wasn't completely real for me. And mm. so I was just like, you know, fascinated by the by the um, customs of the natives kind of, you know, it's just <laughs> like, where, where am I? You know, yeah. And so I found it all fascinating. And then I, at first, I really liked practicing law for the same reasons. But there was this feeling of every day coming to work and putting on a costume. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and covering up my true self. And that really starts to wear on you. Yeah. Yeah. And at a certain point, I read this book called Do What You Are, which helps you figure out your Myers-Briggs type and what your career should be based on that. And it, it, that was one of those epiphany moments. I was like, oh, now I understand why this is the wrong field. Yeah. And where, yeah. I, where I should be instead. So that book, was that the moment where you realized you're an introvert? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, truthfully, not just an introvert, but you know, my type happens to be INFP. And I remember the, the um, careers that were listed under that were like writer and psychologist, mm. and social worker, counselor, things like that. Mm -hmm. And that made total sense to me, you know. I, yeah. I, 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 I didn't even know at that point when I first read the book that writing was going to be the path that I would take. But I just knew that I wanted to be in that very hu human oriented space. So when did you decide to write the book? Well, after a while, I ended up taking a leave of absence from my law firm, thinking that I was going to travel and finding myself instead of traveling, um, enrolling in a class in creative nonfiction at NYU. Hmm. And I went to that class on the very first night. And I had another epiphany moment <laughs> of like, oh, my gosh, this is completely what I should be doing. And from now on, I'm orienting my entire life around this. And I never expected to be able to earn a living as a writer or anything like that. I just thought it was going to be a hobby. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I just thought, okay, I'm going to figure out a way to make a freelance income and focus on this hobby. And so for a few years after that, I was writing memoirs and plays and poetry and a whole bunch of stuff. And I never tried to publish any of it mm -hmm. until I came to quiet and mm -hmm. suddenly... I did. I don't know. Suddenly I wrote a proposal and, and sent it out. And that's where it all started. Wow. That's so brave to go from being a lawyer on Wall Street, which is this, you know, this thing that seems so challenging and such a high level of achievement and to change so much. I wonder if everyone in your life, did they think you were kind of crazy? <laughs> um, I think there was a little bit of that. And also you're reminding me, I haven't thought about this in a while, but um when I read that book about with the Myers-Briggs types, mm -hmm. I got really fascinated by it and I started researching and I found that my type, the INFP, mm -hmm. is the um, makes the least amount of money of all 16 of the types. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if that's what I am too then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and I had never been like an overly materialistic person, but mm -hmm. I, I really did pride myself on being able to, you know, earn a, a living. Mm -hmm. And so that felt like a real bummer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you feel that like all the things that you're drawn to doing are the ones that 
tend not to be well compensated. Oh, yes. And yeah. it's funny, I've just been talking a lot about this with people recently that there's a, there are a lot of things that I'm good at. And at least I'm finally at the point where I can even admit that without feeling like I'm bragging. But one of those things is that I hate asking people for money. Oh, God. I yeah. just hate it so much. And I'm realizing that it's okay. I don't need to have every single skill. I could maybe find someone else who could help me do that, like have another person, hire another person or something who could help me figure out that part of it. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. I mean, like with writers, that's what agents are for. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And it was so funny because well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I will just tell you when I first, um, you know, when, when we first sold Quiet, mm -hmm. um, my writer friends were saying things like, oh, yeah, well, you really knew how to do that because you are such a good negotiator from all your time mm. on Wall Street. And I was like, oh my gosh, if only you knew. I, I really don't like <laughs> negotiating. My agent did the whole thing. It had nothing to do with me. <laughs> yeah. So I've heard you say before that you are an insatiably curious person. And I also feel like I'm that way as well. What do you think makes someone very curious and wanting of knowledge? Because not everyone is like that. Do you think that could be related to introversion? Or is that just a personality trait? I do think it tends to be correlated with introversion, but certainly it's not by any means, you know, the exclusive mm -hmm. <laughs> domain of introverts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we've done some studies mapping introversion and extroversion to the various uh, character strengths hmm. and love of learning we have found does tend to be correlated with introverts. Hmm. So, you know, and I, I don't know why that is, but it might be that there's only so many hours in the day, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're tending to spend time in quieter ways, mm -hmm. there's more time for love of learning and therefore you develop the taste for it more. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think a lot of reasons we do the things we do are no more magical than that. And we're focused, so focused on the inner world too. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. I've always wondered for you personally, what was it like to suddenly be thrust into the spotlight due to your TED Talk success and the book success? Oh, yeah, that was a very crazy transition. <laughs> uh, the, the first few months after the book came out, and that was really hard at the beginning. Like I had been peacefully on my own writing for years. And then on the very first day it came out, I did, I think it was 21 wow. radio interviews plus a TV appearance all in one day. <laughs> um, so that was <laughs> like crossing a Rubicon. Yeah. Um, so the whole first couple of months or so, were very difficult for me. And I remember feeling kind of raw and exposed. Mm -hmm. And then I just got used to it over time. You know, I, I still on any given day would rather be writing. Mm -hmm. But but I'm also perfectly happy to do a media interview. And mm -hmm. like, I care about getting the ideas out. The journalists are usually really nice. So, you know, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, I guess when you're doing something you're passionate about, it's not as difficult. As opposed to you if you're talking about something that you weren't passionate about. You know, I think that's true. And I think that's one of the secret strengths in a weird way of introverts, because mm -hmm. it's so much harder for us to do this stuff, just for the sake of being out there. Like we have, we have to really love it. And in a way that can act as a kind of impetus to force you to mm -hmm. figure out what's the thing I actually like here. Because mm. if you believe in it enough, you'll fight through some of the discomfort yeah. to get your message out there. Yeah, yeah. So now to change the topic a little bit to high sensitivity. Sure. Are you a highly sensitive person? Oh, yeah, I would say so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And in your podcast, you spoke about orchid children. Is mm -hmm. being highly sensitive or having sensory processing sensitivity, as Dr. Lee Aaron has termed it, is that mm -hmm. the same as being an orchid child, so to speak? Well, not necessarily. Um, I mean, because as I understand the, the, um, the thesis of orchid children, mm -hmm. It includes people who are highly sensitive, but it's also broader than that. Hmm. You know, so it's people who are more sensitive in various ways to the world. But but certainly if you're highly sensitive, it's the, the whole idea of orchid children is very relevant. And what do you see as the difference between HSPs and introverts? You know, this is very confusing. It is. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. And I always feel like every time I go out and talk about introversion, I feel like, oh, my gosh, I, there's all these aspects, HSP mm -hmm. versus shyness versus introversion. Right. It's so hard to explain it all. But anyway, 70% um, of highly sensitive people are introverts. Mm -hmm. um, the other 30% are extroverts who still report needing downtime more than your typical extrovert would. Hmm, okay. um, but not all introverts are sensitive. Right. So, like... 
A lot are, I would wager. I don't know that we have any good studies telling us how many, mm-hmm. but I, I would guess it's quite a number. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think there's there are great subsets that aren't. Um, and I see this, you see it in the tech sector. You see a lot of people who I would describe as quite introverted, but I don't think that they're highly sensitive exactly in the Elaine Aaron use of the word. Right. So it's very confusing. Yeah, it is tricky sometimes. Things seem to overlap a bit. Can you talk a little bit about what projects you're working on currently with Quiet Revolution and everything you're doing? Yeah. So we have decided to focus on three main areas. Um, We have our website at rev.com, and that functions as community and source of information about everything having to do with this topic. And then the other big initiatives have to do with schools and workplaces, Hmm. where we've created a quiet ambassador program where we take people inside schools and inside companies who are passionate about these ideas. Mm. Ideally, it's a mix of introverts and extroverts. We train them in our tools and methodologies. They then go out into their organizations and kind of get these ideas out there in an organic way. Mm -hmm. Ideally, with the idea of really cascading this movement inside organizational life. And it's really cool to see what happens because, you know, we see people who um, I mean, I'll speak of some of the more introverted ambassadors. They, they're so passionate about this topic, they then bring it back to their teams. Um, they'll host brown bag lunches. They'll, they'll get their teams to rethink how do they do meetings. And they end up being seen as leaders in ways that they never had been before because they're leading on this issue. It's really exciting. It is so exciting. I love reading about all the things that you're doing because they're so ripe for needing these changes in the workplace of helping introverts be heard and just helping management understand how to nurture introverts and extroverts together and the the strengths that sensitive introverted people bring. I just love it. I eat it up and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. (laughs) We need this. (laughs) Totally. So you're like the champion out there for all of us. But you know, the whole idea of having quiet ambassadors is that it shouldn't be about any one person being the champion. You know, mm-hmm. we're really trying to make this every single ambassador becomes the champion themselves. Mm-hmm. And then hopefully they recruit and anoint and, and mentor new champions. Yeah. You know, and, and our vision is ultimately to have this in every school, university and workplace. And then you could get ambassadors you know, at workplaces acting as mentors to the ambassadors at the university who act as mentors mm-hmm. to the ambassadors at the schools and so on. You know, so it really should be that I could get hit by a proverbial bus and it would matter. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, they would carry the torch. <laughs> exactly. I'm very interested in the work that you've done with Steelcase in the past, which is the largest office furniture manufacturer in the world. I know that you've collaborated with them to design office spaces called Quiet Spaces, which uh, include areas where workers can find a little bit of privacy as opposed to open plan offices, which we all know are evil. I've written so much in the past on my blog about how I hated working in open offices and cubicles. So the work you did with Steelcase especially was exciting for me because office design is so badly in need of an overhaul. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you've done with Steelcase. Yeah, I mean, our vision really was to move offices to a place where people could move freely back and forth between open spaces and more private spaces. And we figured most offices already have the open spaces covered, but they needed help with the private side. Mm-hmm. Um, so with Steelcase, we designed a whole series of private spaces that companies could bring into their open plan offices. And mm-hmm. these would be uh, private spaces that people could really access as they needed to. I, I, you know, I am starting to see a shift ever so gradually in the way designers think about this stuff. Mm-hmm. So I don't see the demise of open plan offices anytime soon. But I do think that private spaces are ever so slowly being incorporated in to the overall design. That's great. I, you know, not, not to the extent, I think, that people need them, but they're at least there. It's definitely shifting. I see more and more and more articles all the time about how people are finally agreeing that open plan workspaces are detrimental to everyone, even extroverts, too. I know. I'm so happy about those articles. I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> But like, really, when I, when I first started researching quiet, I, I was touring around to different workplaces. And at that time, this was like to the year 2006, seven, eight, like around then, you know, people were working in these open plan offices, and it wasn't socially acceptable to say that they didn't like them. Like yeah. there were no such articles back then, mm-hmm. you know, and people were just silently suffering and feeling like, yeah. oh, if I say anything, then they'll think I'm not a team player. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that it's changing. I was I did not suffer silently. <laughs> <laughs> I was the noisy one. I remember, uh, oh man, I have so many stories, but I was in a, one office room with two other people. So there were three of us stuffed into an office that was meant for one person. I hated it. And then they were kind of moving us around. And I was like, hey, can you put me a, in a cubicle instead? And everyone thought I was insane to give up sharing an office with a window with two other people to have my own cubicle. Not that cubicles are great, but I would rather have at least that little bit of privacy rather than being in a room with two other people. And I, um, I also got shields over my cubicle, like to block the light, like three different places I was in. I was the crazy person the HR was like rolling their eyes at, but it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, I completely understand. I will tell you, when I was interviewing for jobs at law firms, which actually are, have, tend to have very traditional mm. office space mm -hmm. that's pretty private. Yeah. Um, but I remember I was going around from law firm to law firm with all these interviews, making notes and the first note was, will I get my own office or not? Oh, and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely become a more important thing for me, too. Um, so I know I have to wrap it up here. So I just have two more questions. Sure. So since writing your first book, you've done so much. You're super popular TED Talk. Uh, you've written another book for teens and kids. Uh, you created Quiet Revolution, Quiet Spaces, podcast, the Quiet Leadership Institute, in your course for parents and more. Out of all of these things, what are you the most proud of? I don't know. I mean, I think I'm happiest that at how much this whole topic is on the map and has become a part of normal everyday conversation yeah. compared to what it used to be. I think that's really it because, you know, I go into schools now and companies. I, I mean, I say I, it's really we, it's like people in my company are doing this mm -hmm. and um, people have heard of it. It's not like yeah. we're introducing the concept for the first time. They've heard of it. They're ready. They're receptive. And that's like incredibly cool. Yeah. It, it's amazing, you know. It is amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I guess the other thing is like I get a lot of letters or talk to people who tell me about ways in which their life was changed by thinking about themselves in this new way. Mm -hmm. And that's the best thing in the world. Yeah. Introversion kind of became this sort of cool thing for a while. Then there was this tiny bit of backlash. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like just like <laughs> yeah, everything. I do. <laughs> I do. But it's funny because when I see those backlash articles, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a highly sensitive person. So mm -hmm. I have a minute of being like, ah. Yeah. But then I always remind myself, you know, a backlash is the sign that you've actually arrived. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, where is your focus in the future? Is there anything else coming up in the pipeline that you wanted to talk about or mention? I mean, I think for Quiet Revolution, the big thing really is the development of the Quiet Ambassador Program and getting to the that future point of really being in every school, every university, and every workplace. If people wanted to get involved with Quiet Revolution or as a Quiet Ambassador, is there any way they can do that? Yeah. I mean, the best thing to do is contact us through the website. So come to quietrev.com mm -hmm. um, and you'll see places to sign up and to contact us. Susan Kane, thank you again so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It's been a great pleasure. You are terrific. Thank you for having me. You can find links to Susan's books and everything we talked about in this episode at the show notes at highlysensitiveperson.net slash Susan. Leave a comment there and let me know what you thought of the show. This episode is brought to you by Plum Deluxe. A great gift for this holiday season is a monthly tea subscription for the tea drinker in your life. Or honestly, just get it for yourself. Who doesn't love getting something in the mail every month? The owner of Plum Deluxe, which is a company out of Portland, Oregon, he contacted me as a fan of the show, and as we communicated, I grew to love not only his tea, but his business's goals and vibrant tea community. The Plum Deluxe Organic Tea of the Month Club is just $10 per month. And with that, you receive one to two ounces of hand-blended tea, which is enough for about 20 cups. You'll also receive a free sample of one additional tea, plus access to a supportive private Facebook group of fellow tea lovers. Just go to highlysensitiveperson.net slash tea for more information and to sign up. Sorry, international listeners, but this is only valid in the U.S. For more episodes and blog posts about HSPs, check out my blog at highlysensitiveperson.net. And you can also check out my book on Amazon, which is called A Highly Sensitive Person's Life, Stories and Advice for Those Who Experience the World Intensely. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a great day.